Greetings, comrades, and welcome part three of a multi-part series, and uh, this is definitely not going to be the last part, as it turns out, of uh, of the series about the Soviet punishments, the KGB gulags, deportations, all these terrible things that we were we were forced to live under for a while, for a large while, to be honest. Well, this episode comes out on Halloween. Or the Reformation Day. The second is what I prefer to celebrate, because Halloween is not very popular here in Latvia. This day is supposed to be about horror, right? And I know a lot of shows will go about and and do something spooky and mysterious, and uh, we don't have that on our show. I had that planned, maybe, but then, well, started doing this more. You know what? I have I have learned over time that you know I'm I'm listening myself to some of these shows about mysteries and the unexplained but at one point I have understood that there is nothing more horrific than humanity itself that the things that men do to other men they are the real really terrible things and we are the true monsters and no no vampire or ghost can match up the massive destruction that we have caused and it's crazy because I'm talking about the fact that you know I'm I'm basically talking about the mass annihilation of my people. Um, I'm talking about very private sufferings in the KGB prisons, and and this time I'll be talking about yeah the mass destruction of people in the Baltics, my people, Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians. And it's crazy because these things didn't happen spontaneously. I will get down to the occupation parts eventually later on the show, but this time this time we'll be talking about the deportations to Siberia and how they happened. Mass exiles, both the gulags and to and to the just remote regions of, of Siberia with, with nothing but you know, a potato and, and a tool there. And this is this is interesting because these things happened in, in nineteen forty and these things happened also in 1949, and it's kind of terrible because, I mean, it turns out because I've, I've been reading a lot of lot of good sources on this one. One of these one of these um, studies, one of the books that I'm using is called *The Unpunished Crime*. It's written by Alfred Berzinc with an introduction by Senator Thomas J. Dodd. I I hope I pronounce his name correctly. And it was written in. 1963, in the United States of America. This is this this book was written by a person who managed to escape to the United States during World War II, and and he writes about his personal experiences here. And this is just one of the one of the many books that I use. But but he only writes about the horrors that happened in in 19, 1940, like the first time the Soviets occupied us. When I, I I don't know he apparently hasn't experienced he has only heard from other people about what happened in in 1946 but this is this is a very dark and, and heavy book among among other things and there there will be some studies from from this book later on on the second part of of this same goes for my for my other sources and the books are kind of starting to pile up lately with the names names not being not being very. <laughs> Very nice here. Anyway, I'm blubbering about too much. It's just that um, after reading about six books about you know my the, the genocide essentially of my own people, how how we were like exterminated. It's um, it's quite scary. You know, it's it's one, probably one of the most hardest things I've done. But here it is, and um, I'd like to start this. And in part one, I would like to I'd like to talk about a certain document which I'm going to actually read in full here. It was, it is, a, it is an order, which was found in a deserted NKVD office in Valka. It is an order in Latvian town. It's, a, it's a city, I suppose, if you count both ha- both halves of it, because it's interesting, because it is a, a one, it's a single city which is shared between us and the Estonians. It used to be two cities. It's Valka and Valga, but since we joined the EU and the Schengen zone, it's basically one city with two different, two different administrations on on both sides, but it's technically the same and they just do very very much things just corporately but yeah over there uh, uh, over there um, 
in the July 1941, when the when the Germans were invading the Soviet Union, uh, they they found an order there, and the deportations had already happened by that point in uh, in Valka. They found an instruction orders, among other documents, uh, which which detailed all of this all of this process, the method of this madness of of mass deportations that uh, that would be carried out in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. This document was, of course, completely top secret. It was signed by Ivan Serov, Deputy People's Commissar of Public Security of the USSR, and it was signed on October 11, 1939. Its file number was 001223. Now, interesting part is that we only got occupied in 1940, not, 19, not 1939, so uh, it's kind of interesting to, to see that... Um, the Soviets were planning on mass deportations and kind of uh, a bit of a good old cleansing, even before they annexed us. And you know, just just like nice pre-made things, which they always have. Not nothing goes out, not nothing goes on without a plan over there. You know, the instructions of of this of these mass deportations are so detailed. They're extremely detailed, and it's a document of. Uh, of inhumanity. You, you sometimes just can't believe what's actually written there. It is just crazy what's going on there, and it, it, it details what was going on in the Soviet Union much better and much more accurately than, I don't know, even some, some reports and some eyewitness accounts from the time. It's a, it's a document that really shows the true character of, of all of this Soviet terror system, and it does it it's like so blatantly and so clearly that I... We'll just read it all to you. It's it's amazing. This this version that I'm reading of it, it's uh, apparently a translation, an English translation, from um, it was done in London by people who managed to manage to escape. And one of these people is this Alfred Berzinch, and he did so in London, and he translated this uh, this document. Before I begin doing this, um, I have to remind you that I've been called biased and, and all sorts of nasty words, especially by Russian trolls. So. I don't know. Here's a whole document, and you can you can see photos of it today uh, in, in occupation. You see, you can just take a look at this, and you can maybe even find it online if you Google it hard enough. Uh, like you know, I did, even even like the English version of it. So talk about what you will about me being biased or people's stories being um, unreliable. But this is an order that's going out there this is this is the official command from the top echelons that's going on there this is this is the official story about what is really going to go on okay it is just important that you hear this really i also hope that you won't mind if i add some commentary in between here obviously <laughs> order number 001223 regarding the procedure for carrying out the deportation of anti-Soviet elements from Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Strictly secret. Paragraph 1. General Situation The deportation of anti-Soviet elements from the Baltic Republics is a task of great political importance. Its successful execution depends upon the extent to which the district operative Troikas and operative headquarters are capable of carefully working out a plan for executing the operations and for anticipating everything indispensable. Moreover, care must be taken that the operations are carried out, carried out without disturbances and panic, so as not to permit any demonstrations and other troubles, not only on the part of those to be deported, but also on the part of a certain section of the surrounding population hostile to the Soviet administration. Instruction as to the procedure for conducting the operations are given below. They should be adhered to, but in individual cases the collaborators engaged in carrying out the operations shall take into account the special character of the concrete conditions of such operations and, in order correctly to appraise the situation, may and must adopt other decisions directed but to the same end, viz. to fulfill the task ent entrusted to them without noise and panic. Now, this actually meant that, um, you know, looting and stealing and extra harshness was not punished, because, you know, this goes under the instructions. They had written them, but as we will see later in part two of this episode, 
they sometimes went even above what was written there. Paragraph number two. Procedure of instructing. The instructing of operative groups by the district Troika. Troika are the three leaders, the, the, pol- the political party leader, the NKV leader, and something, something of that sort. Basically, the Troikas are the administrative leaders at that time, in 1939, of various districts in the Soviet Union. The instructing of operative groups by the district Troika shall be done as speedily as possible on the day before the beginning of the operations, taking into consideration the time necessary for traveling to the scene of operations. On the question of allocating the necessary number of motor car and wagons for transport, the district Troika shall consult the leaders of the Soviet party organized on the spot. Permissions for the issue of instructions must be carefully prepared in advance and their capacity, exits, entrances, and the possibility of strangers entering must be considered. While instructions are being issued, the building must be carefully guarded from operative workers. Should anybody from among those participating in the operation fail to appear for instructions, the district troika shall at once take steps to replace the absentee from a reverse which shall be provided in advance. Through police officers, the Troika shall notify to those assembled a division of the government for the deportation of a prescribed number contingent of anti-Soviet elements from the territory of the said republic or region. Moreover, they shall briefly explain what the deportees represent. Uh, That would be the good old enemy of the state, fascist, counter-revolutionaries, terrible people, blah blah blah. You know, kulaks, deplorables, capitalist scum, so to speak. The special attention of the local Soviet party workers gathered for instructions shall be drawn to the fact that the deportees are enemies of the Soviet people and that the possibility of an armed attack on the part of the deportees cannot be excluded. Well, obviously here. Paragraph number three. Procedure for acquisition of documents. After the general instructions of the operative groups... (coughs) after After the general instructions of the operative groups... Documents regarding the deportees should be issued to such groups. The deportees' personal files must be previously collected and distributed among the operative groups by communes and villages, so that then we are, so that when they are being given out, there shall be no delays. After receipt of personal files, the senior member of the operative group shall acquaint himself with the personal affairs of the families which he will have to deport. He shall, moreover, ascertain the composition of the family the supply of transport for conveyance of the deportee, and he shall receive exhaustive answers to questions not clear to him. Simultaneously, with the issuing of documents, the district troika shall explain to each senior member of the operative group where the families to be exported are situated, and shall describe the route to be followed to the place of deportation. The roads to be taken by the operative personnel with the deported families to the railway station for entrainment shall be indicated. It is also essential to indicate where reserve military groups are stationed, should it be necessary to call them out during trouble of any kind. The possession and state of arms and ammunition of the entire operative personnel shall be checked. Weapons must be in complete battle readiness and magazines loaded, but the cartridge shall not be slipped into the rifle breech. Weapons shall be used only as a last resort when the operative group is attacked or threatened with with attack or when resistance is offered. Paragraph number four. Procedure for carrying out deportations. If the deportation of several families is being carried out in a settled locality, one of the operative workers shall be appointed senior as regards deportation in that village. And under his direction, the operative personnel shall proceed to the villages in question. On arrival in the villages, the operative group shall get in touch, observing the necessary secrecy, with the local authorities, the chairman, secretary, or members of the village Soviets, and shall ascertain from them the exact dwelling place of the families to be deported. Operations shall begin at daybreak. Upon entering the home of the person to be deported, the senior member of the operative group shall assemble the entire family of the deportee into one room, taking all necessary precautionary measures against any possible trouble. After the members of the family have been checked in conformity with the list, the location of those absent and the number of sick persons shall be ascertained after which they shall be called upon to give up their weapons. Irrespective of whether or not any weapons are delivered, the deportee shall be personally searched, and then the entire premises shall be searched in order to discover hidden weapons. 
During the search of the premises, one of the members of the operative group shall be appointed to keep watch over the deportees. Should the search disclosure hidden weapons in small quantities, these shall be collected by the operatives, uh, operative groups and distributed among them. If many weapons are discovered, they shall be piled into the wagon or motor car which has brought the operative group after any ammunition in them had been removed. Ammunition shall be packed together with rifles. If necessary, a convoy for transporting the weapons shall be mobilized with an adequate guard. In the event of the discovery of weapons, counter-revolutionary pamphlets, literature, foreign currency, large quantities of valuables, etc., a brief report of the search shall be drawn up on the spot wherein the hidden weapons or counter-revolutionary literature shall be indicated. If there is any armed resistance, the question of the necessity, necessity of arresting the part parties showing such armed resistance and of sending them to the district branch of the People's Commissariat of Public Security shall be decided by the district Troika. A report shall be drawn up regarding the deport deportees in hiding or sick ones, and this report shall be signed by the representative of the Soviet Party organization. After the completion of the search of the deportees, they shall be notified that by a government decision they will be deported to the other regions of the Union. The deportees shall be permitted to take with them household necessities not exceeding 100 kilograms in weight. There is a list of, of these, these lists, then what, what can they take with them? 1. Suit. 2. Shoes. 3. Underwear. 4. Bedding. 5. Glassware. 7. Kitchen utensils. 8. Foods, an estimated month's supply for a family. 9. Money in their possession. 10. Trunk or box in which to pack articles. It is not recommended that large articles be taken. If the contingent is deported from rural districts, they shall be allowed to take with them small agricultural stocks, axes, saws, and other articles, so that when boarding the deportation train, they may be loaded into special goods wagons. In order not to mix them with articles belonging to others, the Christian name, like the name which you were, which were kind of baptized in, I suppose it's it's meant like this: the Christian name, patronymic, and surname of the deportee and name of the village shall be written on the packed property. Uh, of course, this property was most more often than not simply just stolen from people, and the, the they had like literally no way how to actually carry their stuff because they weren't giving any extra bags and you know if you have if you have been given a very very limited amount of time to actually actually you know move stuff it's hard to take stuff with you and this was one of the more more uh, less adhered to instructions of all of this anyway continue on when loading these articles into the carts, measures shall be taken so that the deportee cannot make use of them for purposes of resistance while the column is moving along the highway. Simultaneously with the task of loading by the operative groups, the representatives of the Soviet Party organizations present at the time prepare an inventory of the property and of the manner of its protection in conformity with the instructions received by them. If the deportee possesses his own means of transportation, his property shall be loaded into the vehicle and together with, the, with his family shall be sent to the designated place of entrainment. If the deportees are without means of transport, carts shall be mobilized in the village by the local authorities as instructed by the senior member of the operative group. Now, really, this, this thing uh, happened very rarely. The property was most likely looted and stolen before. Very, very rarely you, you actually had something with you, because this is just written on paper. I don't know, maybe maybe they intended that you could take something with you, but as we will see in part two, this this didn't happen that often. All persons entering the home of the deportee during the execution of the operations or found there at the moment of these operations must be detained until the conclusion of the operations, and their relationship to the deportee shall be ascertained. This is done in order to disclose persons hiding from the police, gendarmes, and other persons. After verification of the identity of the detained persons and establishment of the fact that they are persons in whom the contingent is not interested, they shall be liberated. If the inhabitants of the village begin to gather around the deportee's home while operations are in progress, they shall be called upon to disperse to their own homes, and crowds shall not be permitted to form. If the deportee refuses to open the door of his home, understanding that he is aware that the members of the People's Commissariat for Public Security have arrived, the door must be broken down. In individual cases, the neighboring operative groups carrying out operations in that locality shall be called upon to help. 
The delivery of the deportees from the village to the meeting place at the railway station must be effected during daylight. Care, moreover, should be taken that the assembling of every family shall not last more than two hours. In all cases, throughout the operations, firm and decisive, decisive action shall be taken without the slightest excitement, noise, and panic. It is categorically forbidden to take any articles from the deportees except weapons, counter-revolutionary literature, and foreign currency, as also to make use of the food of the deportees. Yeah, right. <clears throat> All participants in the operations must be warned that they will be held legally accountable for attempts to appropriate individual articles belonging to the deportees. Like I said, you know, they, they wrote these uh, these things in Moscow sort of humanely. But, you know, the, what this actually meant later on is that, you know, you stole some stuff, you just didn't write it down. Sometimes you, you like, Maybe shared it with someone, but you know later people would come like official looters and just take over all this all this stuff, or it might be given you know to neighbors or something, or just appropriated by the state anyway. Whatever was left appropriated by the state instantly, and you know counter revolutionary materials, literature, and all that stuff. Yeah, that was um, taken very very quickly. Number five, procedure from separating a deportee's family from the head of the family. Now, this is where things get really interesting and the official horror begins. In view of the fact that a large number of deportees must be arrested and distributed in special camps, and that their families must proceed to special settlements in distant regions, it is essential that the operations of removal of both the members of the deportee's family and its head shall be carried out simultaneously, without notifying them of the separation confronting them. After the domiciliary search has been carried out and the appropriate identification documents have been drawn up in the deportee's home, the operative worker shall complete the documents for the head of the family and deposit them in the latter's personal file. But the documents drawn up for the members of his family shall be deposited in the personal file of the deportee's family. The convoy of the entire family to the station shall, however, be effected in one vehicle, and only at the station of the departure shall the head of the family be placed separately from his family in a car specifically intended for heads of families. During the assembling of the family in the home of the deportee, the head of the family shall be warned, warned that personal male effects must be packed in a separate suitcase, as a sanitary inspection of the deported men will be made separately from women and children. So yeah, you basically are instructed to blatantly lie to people. That that is the least of their offenses, but still, pretty funny they're, they're taking such delicate care. At the stations of enter entrainment, heads of families subject to arrest shall be loaded into cars specially allotted to them, which shall be indicated by operative workers appointed for that purpose. Number 6, like part 6. Mm -hmm. Procedure for convoying the deportees. The assistants convoying the columns of deportees in house carts are strictly forbidden to sit in the said carts. The assistants must follow alongside and behind the column of deportees. The senior assistant of the convoy shall from time to time make the rounds of the entire column to check the correctness of the movement. When the column of the deportees is passing through inhabited places or when encountering passers-by, the convoy must be controlled with particular care. Those in charge must see that no attempts are made to escape and no conversation of any kind shall be permitted between the deportees and passers-by. Paragraph number 7. Procedure for Entrainment At each point of entrainment, a member of the operative Troika and a person specially appointed for that purpose shall be responsible for entrainment. On the day of entrainment, the chief of the entrainment point, together with the chief of the deportation train and of the convoying military forces of the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs, shall examine... The railway cards provided in order to see that they are supplied with everything necessary and the chief of the entrainment points shall agree with the chief of the deportation train on the procedure to be observed by the latter in accepting delivery of the deportees. Red Army men of the convoying forces of the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs shall surround the entrainment station. The senior members of the operative group shall deliver to the chief of the deportation train one copy of the nominal roll of the deportees in each rail car. The chief of the deportation train shall, in conformity with this list, call out the name of each deportee, shall carefully check every name and assign the deportee's place in the railway car. The deportee's effect shall be loaded into the car together with the deportee, with the exception of the small agricultural inventory, which shall be loaded in a separate car. The deportees shall be loaded into railway cars by families. 
It is permitted to break up a family, with the exception of heads of families subject to arrest. An estimate of 25 persons to a car should be observed. After the railway car has been filled with the necessary number of families, it shall be locked. After the people have been taken over and placed in the deportation train, the chief of the train shall bear responsibility for all persons handed over to him and for their delivery to their destination. After handing over the deportees, the senior member of the operative group shall draw upon a report on the operation carried out by him and briefly indicate the name of the deportee, whether any weapon and counter-revolutionary literature have been discovered, and also how the operation is carried out. After having placed the deportees on the deportation train and having submitted reports of the results of the operation to be thus discharged, the members of the operative, operative group shall be considered free and shall act in accordance with the instructions of the chief of the district branch of the People's Commissariat of Public Security. Written by Deputy People's Commissar of Public Security of the USSR, Commissar of Public Security of the Third Rank, signed Serov. Now let's talk about who were these deported people and um, let's get into some more personal stuff here. The victims who were to be deported were selected on the basis of, uh, of lists drawn up by Russian agents and native spies. The documents that were discovered after uh, the Soviets fled for the first time revealed that the slightest infraction or fancied violation of Soviet law was, you know, as, as expected excuse enough to arrest some people. For instance, at the headquarters of the militia in the Yakapils district, a letter was found showing that a certain Daukulis, a militia leader in the parish of Elksni, had received an order from Kevitis, who was a representative of that district, calling for a special list of all those who exhibited anti-communist tendencies. And this Daukulis, being a very loyal communist, had drawn up such a list. Uh, that was also found in the headquarters files in which he named the members of the defense guards and identified other, quote, enemies of the state, such as instructor, has crossed out the names of the workers, that is, red list of candidates. That means you had a party list and you can cross out the people you don't like in them, so, you know, you vote for the rest, even though that's the only, only list. Even if you try to use rights by the Soviet constitution for you to vote, yeah, you are an enemy of the nation because you don't vote for everyone. It's crazy. And also, has described the Bolshevik government as a government of slavery and ruin. And other such ma ma minor infractions, really. A similar list was found among the ab abandoned papers of uh, certain Mezhaputya, a Soviet militiaman in the parish of Lielvarde. Addressed to the chief of Riga section of the People's Commissariat of the Internal Affairs, it read, Quote, in connection with the removal of anti-Soviet elements, I bring to your notice that persons whose attitude to the Soviet regime is unfavorable and who spread various upsetting rumors have again made, the, made their appearance. In this list he names eight men and women. All such lists in Latvia were sent to Shustin, this commissar of the interior of Soviet Latvia in Riga, who gave the final orders of, as to those to be picked up. Two documents found in his files show a map of the points at which the victims were to be assembled and loaded and a map of the special slave labor camps, our favorite gulags in Siberia, to which they were to be transported. And if the mentality of all these nice people killing my, my countrymen is fully revealed, kind of, you can, you can just see them by the fact that the, the deportees, they weren't counted by the number of individuals. No, 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 no. They were counted by the number of freight cars needed to haul them away. It's it's kind of crazy when you think about it. And here we have an eyewitness testimony, uh, which is written in um, one of my other sources, A Total Terror by Albert Kalma. He writes that uh, he has an eyewitness, and he doesn't name him though, but an eyewitness states in his book, <clears throat> quote, The morning of June 14th, a sunny day I will never forget. The bus in which I was riding to work passed a score of motor lorries full of civilians standing or sitting on bundles wrapped in bedsheets. Each truck was guarded by several militiamen or Czechists, their rifles pointed into the miserable group. At first, I could not believe what was happening. Soon the bus passed the freight station at Turnikons, or a suburb of Riga. I saw hands, adult and childish, childish, stretched from the barbed wire windows of the trains. Each hand held a mug. Each hand shook hopelessly. The next day I attended the church service. Everyone present sobbed like children, and we found it impossible even to sing. I shall never forget the urgency of the prayers 
for we knew that no one but God would help us. Now, a certain Otilia Bashtika, a social worker who apparently at the time of this report was living in the United States of America, has reported about this because uh, she managed to escape from, from the deportations and managed to move to the United States. So these are very valuable sources that I'm using here because not even Latvian people have read these books written by the people who managed to escape to the Western world. So She reports... Wives were separated from their husbands, children torn away from their parents and showed into cattle trucks with barred windows which were crowded to suffocation in the heat of summer. Yeah, the idea of 25 people per train, no, that never really happened. My brother and his sick wife and two small children were in that group. The driver who took them to the station told me later that my poor brother protested against being separated from his family and demanded to be allowed to join his wife. He was led aside and shot. We found his bloody body days later. Farmers with cans of milk drove to the station that day, intending to give, give the milk to the children. Those who dared approach the trucks were shot like dogs. Days later, people found slips of paper along the tracks, reading, We are dying. Save Latvia. There are 13 known regions for slave establishments, as very correctly the author of this book called Gulags. Vorkuta, Pechora Uhta, Kolima, Marinska, in central northern Siberia, Karangada in Central Asia, Tashkent in Turkestan, the island of Vaigach in the Arctic, Karelia near the Finnish border, Murmansk, Sahalin in the Far East, the Cape of Chelyutskin, Kamchatka, Rostovon Don, and the Volga Karma Pechora region. We won't actually have much of information about these slave camps unless there were some escapees. A few survivors of these these living hells have managed to reach the West. And one of them, former resident of Friga, escaped from the Pechorlaga camp near the Polar Circle, 12 miles from where the Kovzh River joins the Pechor. He apparently had traveled over hundreds of miles in dense forest to Tundra and Taiga, evading the MVD and its wolfhounds, and he managed to reach the American occupation zone in Germany. And the writing of this book, where this again is uh, described, uh, this this event is described, because this book was written in 1951, and you know Stalin's agents were in full force still. His name had to be kept secret, and I can understand the author of this book, but we shall we shall return to less anonymous testimonies here too. But basically, the the person who escaped uh, describes what was going on kind of as follows. At Pechorlaga, we had to carry out tasks requiring superhuman strength. Every day, there are no Sundays in the camps, we had to fill a certain quota. Every one of us had to clear 12 cubic meters, digging up the soil and casting it out of the trenches which reach far into the forest. This vast mass of soil not only had to be dug up, but also loaded into the horse-drawn carts or push carts drawn by the deportees themselves, and taken to a designated place along the railroad. An exception was made only in those districts where the soil was particularly heavy or frozen. There the quota was only, only, four cubic meters. During the severe winter, when the soil does not even yield to an axe, or during the short summer when when one could hardly distinguish human beings because of the dense clouds of gnats and mosquitoes, these demands were sheer madness. The quota could only be reached by a few of us who were physically fit and used to hard manual labor. People who have languished in prison, prisons and then been weakened by a long journey in the discomforts of the camps, and especially people who have belonged to the intelligentsia, cannot accomplish these tasks. Thus, the sadistic system of the Soviet deportation camps, which kills both a man's soul and body, shows, shows its real character. The quota was a matter of life and death for us, because the food ration varied according to the work accomplished. The full ration only given to those who accomplished the quota, consisting of one piece of bread for the whole day. That is, all, that is all the digger was given, and this applies to all the hundreds of thousands who are now building a new railroad across the dense virgin forests and the tundra. The drinking water was not boiled unless those who were too weak to go to work boiled it for the workers. As for the bread, the, sickly, the sticky grayish black mass distributed at Pechorlaga could hardly be called by that name. It is a kind of bread substitute which lies in one's stomach like a heavy stone and ruins even the strongest constitution. Among the groups, crack workers' feats and stakhanov working methods were organized. 
Whoever achieved 14 cubic meters instead of 12 received, according to the camp regulations, a valuable premium. Another 150 grams of the above, quote, bread, end quote. I have seen people who were granted such premiums. They were either stronger individuals, squandering their last reserves of strength in order to get the better quota, or they were despicable creatures who cringed before the group leaders or the assessor of the day's quota. All those who did not achieve the quota saw their bread ration diminish, and, with it, every hope that they would remain among the living inmates of the Petrolaga camp. I succeeded in tracing the deported Latvians. During the second half of May, most of them were sent another 300 kilometers further north in the direction of Vorkuta, to the Soviet area where oil and coal had been discovered. Their task was to construct the railroad which is being built over human corpses and through human sufferings. When the first hundreds of Latvians reached the Bear Tundra, that was, co- that was, when th- that was then covered with snow. They were told by the Czechists, This is your camp. All around them were the desert plains covered with snow, and here and there a stunted tree. Four poles driven into the earth defined the limits of the camp. The only tools the prisoners possessed were their spades, but they had to dig holes in the snow and frozen earth, and to light fires in them using the moss they had collected for miles around instead of firewood. At night, they lay in the ashes to keep warm. In the morning, the Czechists, who had passed the night in tents which they had brought with them, ordered the Latvians to go digging and building the camp. Instead of bread, they were giving dried slices of the clammy substitute. They drank thawed ditch water and melted snow. Swords of exhausted, frozen and sick people dropped out of their, on the ranks during the first days. Dysentery raged among them, and feeble as they were, and without any medical assistance whatsoever, they were extinguished like candles. The next scourge visiting the camp was scurvy. Large bluish-black spots appeared in the bodies, spasms convulsed, convulsed arms and legs. The spots turned into festering sores. The gums bled. The teeth fell out, and the tongues became rough and cracked. Unless the patient was given more nourishing food, onions, vinegar, or vitamin C, he died in two or three weeks. Thus, hundreds of people remained in Tundra forever. Now, this eyewitness was later made a registrar in the section, kind of um, disposing of the corpses at his sanitary settlement as he had to describe this. This enabled him, the eyewitness, to get an insight into, into more of Czech sadism, another aspect of it. Quote, In the course of my work there, I witnessed indescribable horrors. An average of 400 to 450 patients out of a total of, 12, of 1,200 to 1,300 died every month. It was an awful having to see the sufferings of those punished by the Czech and to look upon their corpses. The most insignificant transgression, for, ex- for instance, a patient's refusal to go to work, is punished by the guards as a warning lesson to the others. The victim is completely stripped and bound, and left lying in the open for five or ten minutes. In the summer, a naked man is covered by a thick layer of flies and gnats within a moment. He tosses about helplessly, trying to protect himself against the deadly cloud attacking him, and screams in his agony until he finally loses consciousness. Very few recover from this punishment. In the winter, where the frost reaches 40 and to 50 and more degrees in centigrade, the, na- the naked bodies of the Czechist victims are frozen within a few minutes. Suffering unspeakable agonies, they spend a few days in the barracks of the camp and finally find their way to the common grave of the millions of slaves who have been driven to their death at Petra. Stories will continue because, oh boy, I have gathered, gathered a lot, both from both from the emigree sources and the local people who managed to be... managed to survive. I'll give you now a report of a... of a male Jewish citizen of uh, Latvia who was deported during the first deportations in 1940. He wrote a letter from Tel Aviv because he managed to escape and he escaped to Israel. And he wrote to the Latvian legation in Washington, D.C. on May 21, 1951 from Tel Aviv. The original letter is is still found in the archives of the Latvian legation in Washington because uh, it's I'm sure it's called a bit differently but they they certainly in Latvian centers are, are still there. I don't know, maybe it's still called Latvian legation. It was certainly Latvian legation at the time, so I, th- I think it might still be there. Just the historical evidence, but still. Essentially, it's it's still found there. 
and it's um it's another tale of of what really happened to these people and uh if you if you expect anything nice or any funny jokes coming out of this episode then uh not going to happen the report of this jewish man reads well partially at least as i'm not going to read all of it but it reads as follows i had been pressed into an overcrowded freight cart for 40 people or 8 horses, with barred windows and two stories of wooden cots, filled with sweating people, only men in this case. There were about 60 people in our car. Uh, reminder, instructions spoke about 25 people and no more, and allowing to take your positions with you. Obviously, this was not the case. In the middle of the car, there was a hole in the floor, for our natural needs, so to speak. It was unbearably hot and all suffered from thirst. The door was locked from the outside. It was prohibited to approach a window. The guard on duty delivered two pails with which the superintendent of the car went for water. The distribution of water caused painful quarrels. Later on, the story continues. Not far from Yuchnovo, we witnessed the first tragic accident. Driving along a river, a young man named Ansbergs jumped from the rear bench of the truck into the river, tearing off his clothes. Our two guards fired salvos. This alarm brought members of the administration to, of the distribution center to the spot and a hot pursuit began. The next morning we learned that Ansbergs had been dragged out of the river with an injured leg and it was rumored that he was shot on the spot without trial. Everyone was, was in a terribly depressed mood. Further on. We were loaded on the train in the same manner as in Shirwa Tavariga, under the vigilance of a similar escort. We traveled several weeks in the same train until we reached the station of Solikamsk in the Molotov district. The train had stopped only at nights on side tracks, far away from stations, in order to prevent the local population from seeing us. Several persons died on the way. Leo Levstein, former president of the International Bank, the merchant Snickers, co-owner of the Lima Company, Segals and others, their bodies were disposed of at the nearest stations en route. In Solikamsk, we, in Solikamsk, we were unloaded and entered into a transitionary prison. But a few days later, the whole group was sent on foot to three concentration camps. Surmog, Ust Surmog, and Prizhen, located in the woods at a distance of approximately 15 kilometers from each other, at about 100 kilometers from Solikamsk. These three camps, called commanderies by the Bolsheviks, were under the unified supervision of the NKVD, and in each of them, four to, five, four to 500 prisoners were kept. Guarded in the usual way, we had to walk two days. On the way, several prisoners collapsed from exhaustion. They were delivered to the dogs, which bit them to such an extent that they soon died after having been brought to the camp. A well-known fur, de fur dealer from Riga died in this manner. A great, a great number of our Latvian co-nationals perished while lumbering into the woods. Some were killed by falling trees during work, but many froze to death. A great percentage died from cold and pneumonia, but particularly from hunger and exhaustion. The administration frequently transferred prisoners from one camp to another, and this occurred chiefly on very frosty days. The victims had to walk on foot from 15 to 20 kilometers without adequate footwear or clothing. They contacted colds and died. This was one means of getting rid of the old people, but most of the prisoners died from pellagra, a disease which is widespread in the camps. The symptoms of the disease are deep skin lesions, particularly on legs, even laying bare in the bones, this being accompanied by apathy, fading of memory, and insanity. The disease is caused by lack of indispensable vitamins in the body. During the eight months which I have spent in the camp, we have not one single time received meat, fats, or sugar. Apart from the daily bread ration of 340, of 300 to 40 gram, 400 grams of, and the balanda soup, balanda is a weed, we received on rare occasions a watery porridge and sometimes herring. We were like living corpses in a valley of death. During our journey to our dismal destination, we had learned about the start of the war from propaganda placards at railroad stations. This news filled our hearts with hopes for quick deliverance from slavery and that our treatment might be improved. Illusions of the drowning. Many of us, some prominent personalities, were induced by starvation to dig in the garbage cans near the kitchen for potato peels, rotten cabbage leaves and other remains. They were washed and secretly cooked in the barracks. Further from the letter. 
The corpses of the deceased were placed in the snow in the yard of the hospital. They, they laid there quite openly, visible to everyone. But we became accustomed to this horrible sight. That much our heart had grown indifferent to what had become our accustomed sight of, in our daily life. After eight to twelve corpses had accumulated, they were loaded on slates and were carried far outside the zone and buried there in a mass grave. Only the grave diggers selected from among us, usually chosen were the closest friends of the deceased, were permitted to accompany the corpses. And also Professor Ludis Adamovich, who said a prayer in the graveyard and delivered our, fa our farewell to the late comrades. Crosses, plagues, or other memorial signs of the graves were prohibited. Thus there perished in the strange country the best and most cultured representatives of the nation. But our jailers? They were not in the slightest disturbed by my presence in the office, and they sat gaily and loudly talking to one another while watching the transportation of the said load of corpses from the hospital. May the rest of the scum follow soon. At that moment I suffered more than ever in my life from being conscious of my helplessness. While in Sitkivar, shortly before my escape, I succeeded in seeing my friends and fellow sufferers, Zarinch and Latsons. I learned from them that new transports of Latvians who could remain in Latvia after the end of the German occupation had been brought to Sitkivar and vicinity. Latvia was to be cleansed out of people who had been, quote, infested with Hitlerism, end quote. We met a number of them on the street, a technical engineer of the WEF electrical plant and several representatives of Latvian intelligentsia, most of them women. Those who knew the Russian language were getting some employment, but such were few. A former real estate owner, an old man, sat begging with an outstretched hand. Thus had begun the new phase in the Bolshevik sea scheme of annihilating the core of the Latvian population, which was now being carried out on a large scale. And another story. This is from Miss Alice Braunstein, a farmer's wife who was deported from Latvia in March 1949. She spent 10 years in Siberia before she was permitted to return home. From there, she contacted her children, who had meanwhile left the country as refugees from communism and found asylum in Australia. After prolonged efforts on the part of relatives, she was permitted to join them and arrived in Australia in July 1960. Now, uh, this sometimes happened, but very, very, very rarely, and mostly was done, you know, as a matter of showing goodwill, or for some other services. Essentially, this wasn't the norm. You weren't allowed to emigrate if you were just a Latvian. Uh, some Jews were allowed to emigrate to Israel during later years, but Latvians emigrating with the help of contacts... Oh, this was not normal. There must have been some very, very special special occasions for this to happen. And like I said, sometimes it was done basically through the blood noise system, as usual. She must have done something, something for the government to allow her to go, or just got insanely lucky on this one. Anyway. Her experience, which is similar to that of thousands of other deportees, only more fortunate in that at the end she managed to get out, she related to the Australian correspondent of the magazine Likes, one of the correspondents of Latvian magazines abroad in, 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 in like, this immigration. That is why we have a lot of lot of our relatives, a lot of Latvian people in Australia and Canada and the United States and and UK and many other places. And uh, I hope that at least some of them are listening to, to this show and that I represent their opinions fairly and, and do them justice because these people also deserve, deserve to know the truth and what was going on here. The following is a translation, English translation of her story, which was serialized in the Latvian language newspaper, published in the issues of August 3, 6, 10, 13, and 17, in 1960. I know every brush and every path in this terrain, therefore don't be fearful, I shall always find my way back to you, said my husband Janis Braunsteins when, late in the summer of 1944, he and our daughter Laum left me alone on our 100 hectare farm called Sigas to go to our other farm, Jaunzemi, in the neighboring township. It was necessary for us to divide the work because our sons had been drafted. On September 15, 1944, the yard of the Sigas was flooded by German soldiers, and I waited for my husband to come back in vain. He did not show up. There was cannon thunder among, along the horizons, and by next morning I understood that the chances of seeing my husband were very slim because the Russian army had broken through between the Sigas and the Jaunzemi. 
On September 16, the Russians were only a few hundred yards from our farm, and there was a battle going on in the nearby, on, on in the nearby cemetery. I was completely alone in the siege with no relative to help me, but the roads were blocked by armed men and the din of battle along the highway was getting louder. A few hours later our farm was taken by the Russians. Suddenly the phone rang. I was very surprised that it still worked, but lifted the receiver and heard the question, How are you doing? It was my son who spoke from the neighboring township of Baldua, and I answered, Well, I am winning... Well, I am whining and dining the Russians. Also, I told my son not to try to come home, and thus we said farewell to one another for 16 years. I, hear, I heard no more from my family, because, as I learned later, the Russians had occupied our Ryonzami farm too. On September 17th, and despite my assurance, my husband had not managed to get back to me. Shortly before the Russians entered the Seagas, I had been hiding in the cellar because of the shots that rang all around. When I emerged from the cellar, the Russians were making themselves at home, eating and drinking and robbing. The battle went on nearby and at the distance, but they didn't bother me. On the morning of September 17, I decided to, th to try to go to a friend's farm some four kilometers from ours. But when I got there, everything was just as it had been in our own farm. So I rode back home, but on the way I was stopped by some Russians, and they unyoked our good mare and took it. I begged them, at least, to let me have another horse instead, and they did this so I could get back home. However, it had been filled up with Russian soldiers, and they would not let me in. Go to the forest, one Russian shouted at me, and so I joined the great flock of people who already had taken to hiding in the woods. There were crying children and weeping women and dead people, and through, all, through it all we frequently heard the voices of Russians. The woods were still full of Latvian gorillas, although they were caught one after another, no matter how carefully they tried to hide. One of them, I heard, had even dressed as a woman in order to hide. It was a dreadful experience to know that Latvian men had no place to stay or go, and that wherever they turned, the Cheka was waiting for them. Although there were opposite experiences as well. I learned that one communist collaborator had been hiding throughout the years of Nazi occupation under the bed of his mother. Now he emerged and became a man of great power. In the spring of 1948, our home in the Seagas was taken from me and turned into an auxiliary building for a leather factory. I had to move into a small out outhouse. However, even in those days of hardship, there were kind-hearted people around. I kept running into helpful people all through the dreadful 16 years. I found that even on the township executive committee, which was communist, obviously, there were some honest people, and although our farm was expropriated, they granted me five hectares of land for my own use. At the same time, I was listed as a, as a kulak, and they levied the kulak tribute on me. I had to deliver meat, butter, and grain. I sowed one half of hectare of, of land with rye, and grew it so well that they could take a whole ton of grain from me. Nearly five years had passed by, by since I lost all my relatives when I was forced to leave the Seagas for good. All that time I lived in our, in our small outhouse and had two cows, one being the calf of the first. It was March 25, 1949. I woke up at 5 in the morning. An hour later, at 6, I heard an automobile approaching and saw a pretty big truck stop on the highway. I saw armed men get out of it in a great hurry and wondered whom they were out to catch. Then they came right across the little, little meadow and surrounded my own house. I was still at a loss to explain what was happening when they broke right into my room. All of them, they spoke Russian, but among them, I recognized one Latvian, the local party organizer whose name was Evalds and who one, once had been a farm owner himself in the township of Baldwin. Also, I recognized the faces of some of the Russians who were on the executive committee. The Russian officer sternly demanded to know, Who lives here? And I answered, The Braunschneids used to live here, but now I'm here all alone. The Russians wanted to know whether there was someone else, and I said, No. He told me, We shall move you to Siberia. I speak Russian well and told him, What are you going to do with me, an old and ailing person in Siberia? I won't move anywhere, better shoot me right here. But the Russian answered, No, no, we, are, we aren't permitted to shoot. He produced a paper from his pocket and read something aloud, but my mind refused to follow it. Then he pushed the paper before me and told me to sign it. My hand trembled and I wrote, Ah, Braunsteins, and collapsed on the couch. I felt unconscious. The only thing I still heard was Ewald's voice. You must be ready in half an hour, and we must get going. I spent the half an hour they had granted me sitting on the couch and doing nothing. I didn't even follow the suggestion to pack a few things to take along. It was Ewald's himself who started doing this with the help of some of the Russians. They went into the other room and brought back the school uniform caps of my sons, which I had preserved as keepsakes, and threw them on the table. This somehow awakened me, and I got up and took the caps and threw them into the fire. I thought, better let the caps burn than to leave them where, where, where some Russian might wear them. Thus, the half hour went by. I had to go. Only later did I realize what a blessing it was that someone forced me to put on my fur coat. 
I was petrified. The men dragged me over the threshold. I couldn't at this moment have taken one step by myself. All sorts of thoughts ran through my head, but I couldn't think clearly. I was dragged across the yard where once my children had played and later had helped with work. So, towards the highway where the truck was waiting. My home, the farm of Sigus, remained behind me, but not one tear came from my eyes. Suffering was no longer new to me. I was now the last of my kin being taken away from my home. Where will you take me? I asked them. Why don't you shoot me down right here? I asked Tevolts, but he was silent. Then we got to the truck and the men took a chair and put it down on the pole and, and lifted me up on the chair and then pushed me into the truck. After a short ride the truck stopped at the neighboring farm, the Birzgal of Baldwin, and there the deporters were looking for the Markevich family, but they found only the old farm mistress and put her in the truck next to me. Later I learned that the two st sons of the Markevich, both students in Riga, had been taken from there and sent to the Amur in Siberia. Next the truck went to Tseplish Hills, where we stayed until the evening of March 25, waiting for more victims to be taken along. But that night we were nine families together and could discuss how each of us had been arrested. It, I also took a lo look at the things they had packed for me to take along, although still with no real interest. There was a piece of meat, a little flour, some clothing, and an umbrella. The youngest among the victims was the two-year-old Yuris Kivkuls, whose father and mother had fled into the forest. Later, the father was caught in Riga and deported just the same, while the mother, as a result of the terrible experience, had a stroke. The little son Yuris was on, the, on, the, on this day, March 25, put into the truck together with his grandparents, the Kevitas, the grandfather died later. The little boy's seizure had been especially dramatic, or rather savage. When the captors entered the house, the little boy was sleeping, and the grandparents had begged them to leave Yuris alone. But when the Russians yelled at them, We will take that boy naked if you don't dress him the right away. Thus began the trip to Siberia of the two-year-old war criminal. There were many of us from Baldo and the township who shared this horrible fate. Three trucks, all heavily guarded, were brought together to the Tseplish hills, and later in the evening they were proceeded to the railroad station of Uagra. There, were, there we were put into the cattle cars of which a long train was formed. All the cars were crowded, nobody told us where we would be taken, but on the minds of us there was only one word, Siberia. Only later did we learn that, on March 25, 1949, and also on some other days around this date, a mass deportation had taken, taken place from Latvia and Lithuania, in which, which differed little from the deportations of earlier dates. Later, later I heard people talk with great surprise about one township in Zemgala, from which not one single person had been deported. They said it was the local executive committee which somehow had saved them. Uh, yes, and apparently she living in the, in the United States by this point, hadn't heard about uh, Edward Cowlidge and Lielvar. This is this is why this guy this guy is so famous because he managed to be the, the ruler of the Kolhos here. He ran the Kolhos of large places, he managed to trick the Soviet government into into basically, you know, when, when the, the corn was be, was forced to being raised, which I mentioned like my first episode ever uh, the Khrushchev era about the, the forced corn growing and all the insanities of the uh, Russian economy, he managed to stave that off. And Edward Skalinch, he is remembered to this day because he managed to use his position of power to basically save everyone there in Lielvar. He basically stated to the party officials, everyone here is an honest communist, there are no traitors here, period. Not one person from that town was sent anywhere. And you know, he's still remembered to this day. One of the national heroes and uh, schools now named after him. There were some good people. There are always some good people around, but there's just, you know, not many of them to be around, to be honest. Carrying on. The farther we went eastwards from Uagre, the more crowded were the stations with echelons of deportees. This clearly indicated that we were give we were all victims of a mass deportation. From babies to grey-haired old people. We spent days and nights in the cattle cars, which had no toilet facilities, and this became one of our greatest problems. We tried as much as was possible to wait until the train stopped. Then all the people were out and all around the train. At first, most were rather bashful, but we soon lost our sense of shame, there was simply, there, for there simply was no other way. Women and men, all next to each other, had to do what nature demanded. Demanded on how one wants to look at these things, there were either tragic or comic scenes with all, the pe all these people squatting along the train. When we were far away from Latvia, the tracks were jammed with deportee trains, and there were many people who could not endure it and died on the way. 
We saw the same scenes at every station, stretches loaded with corpses of dead people. At first this horrified us, but then we got used to that too, although we were always happier when the train stopped in the dark of night, because then at least we were spared these sights. On the other hand, it was much more different at night to find a little brush with the kindled fires in the iron stoves of the cars. We were two weeks underway before we reached the district of Asino in the farther north of the Soviet Union, where the train terminated. We knew very little about our real whereabouts. All that we did know was we were in Siberia, and in the district called Asino. For us it seemed the end of the world, and it was only years later when some of us had the opportunity to look it up on a map that we got a clearer perception of where we had been brought to. We found out that our pleasure ride, so to speak, from Latvia had been over 8,000 kilometers long, and that on the way we passed Moscow, Molotov, Svetlovsk, Omsk, Novosibirsk, and other cities to arrive at a place well north of Tomsk. Even farther north was another slave labor camp area, Narim, and to east of us followed the river Yenisei. To the northwest of us, above the Arctic Circle, was Vorkuta. I cannot believe that there is any place in the world colder than the area to which we were brought, but that we were not at the very northern end of Siberia. The endless regiments of the deported people were put, on, put off the trains and taken to a large camp which had shortly before been inhabited by German POVs. The barbed wire around the camp had been taken down, and this made us feel slightly better, as we were thinking about the life ahead of us. Down below the camp followed the river Ob, which ran through western Siberia to the Arctic Ocean. Along it moved thousands of people, the deportees and their guards. Everyone, everywhere we heard the Latvian language. We, the group from Baldwin, were still trying to cling together, while we kept wondering about what a terrible, terrible place Father Stalin brought us to. The conditions were indeed very bad, unsanitary, depressing, even torturous. Every morning we received bread and a kind of soup that was black as a tar. The dirt was indescribable, even though everybody tried to unload garbage and dung in the river. However, we also had to take water from that same river not only for washing, but also for drinking. It is impossible to tell how many people died in this camp. Not long after our arrival, all the deportees were brought together and a Russian announcer, you have been brought here for your li and a Russian an announcer declared, you have been brought here for your lifetime. We looked at each other, but our feelings were already so obtuse that only some were very few that only some very few were crying. On that day they took away our passports and the papers of and other papers of identification. At the time we were told that there was another trip ahead of us, this one by ship. However, this trip could not be undertaken if for no other reason than because of the ice drifting on the stream of the Ob. The trip did not begin until a month later after we had arrived and started living through the cold of the nights and the days which sometimes were slightly warmer at the stinking camp of the river bench. River, river bank. We were loaded into a motor launch, which took, up, took us a full day's voyage along the river northwards. When night came, we were thrown out of the bank, literally pushed off into a thicket of bushes beyond which rushed the endless Siberian tiger. However, there was one pleasant surprise. For the first time, we received canned food for dinner. There, was, it wasn't, there wasn't much, but it tasted wonderful. Now, now continuing on uh, a bit later in, in this study, because um, she's, 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 otherwise we'll, we'll get into mass descriptions, because this one is quite a long one, and we still have... Uh, we still have ways to go. We arrived there uh, at the eve of the Easter, 1949, but of course no one at Asino spoke of Easter, excepting that we, the little group of Latvians, remember the days past in our own land. Before long we were driven into a big white ship named Komsomoyets. It stopped many times on its way, and here and there small groups of people were debarked while the rest of us continued on the way. When we got to the vicinity of Krasnoyarsk, I was assigned to the group which had to debark. Again we spent the night freezing on the riverbank, under an open sky. In the morning, the so in the morning, the how I like to call them, slave traders arrived in five horse carts to select workers from among the deportees. The young ones were taken away immediately. When only we, the older people, were left, a smart-looking Tatar came up to came up to us and asked, "Is there any one of you? And is there anyone among you who knows how to tend the bees?" We didn't know what to answer, but the Tatar said, "Speak up freely. It will be good work and a good kolkhoz." Then three of us, all from families in Baldwin, volunteered. We were, we, we were willing to believe the words of the Tatar because the horses before his cart appeared well kept. Besides, we had no real choice because there were only a few of us, all elderly, elderly women. When riding through the taiga, we approached something like a little village. He urged, uh, he urged on the horses and said, well, here's your kolkhoz. It's called Timofeyevka. Once again, like so often in these years, I had been lucky because the people said that the director of this kolkhoz was considerate and tried to make life here in taiga as pleasant as possible. 
Also, other members of this colchos had understanding for us newcomers. They were neither surprised nor shocked by our stories. They were people just like we were, accepting that they belonged to other oppressed nationality groups and had been deported to this place much earlier. I learned that this sharing of life... life... I, I learned that this sharing of like fates made the years of my life in Siberia much earlier to bear. It was indeed true that here, at a place which never before had been inhabited by human beings, they had made fields and built a few houses with roofs on top of them. All, and all of this we have done with our own hands, the Tatars and the Bashkirs stated more than once, and not with a certain, uh, certain pride. And later on in the story. <clears throat> After four years, a great wonder happened in our Kolkhoz. The first tractor arrived. Also, we saw some combines. It was said that four collective farms of the area had been merged into one larger economic unit. All the engineers of the tractors and the combines, whether Latvians or Lithuani Lithu Lithuanians, deported to this area. For the other people, handling of the machines seemed much too complicated. From the day of our arrival to the end of our stay, we had to register periodically at the district com commandantura, so that they would know we hadn't run away. Each year there were also sorts of elections in which all were required to take part. When people were ill, they brought the ballot boxes right to their beds and demanded that the ballots be cast, even though naturally no one was interested in this balloting. Usually we didn't even know what the voting was about. Once I received a little money from a friend who had been deported to Siberia in 1941 and spent ten years in a slave labor camp, and then settled to live in Krasnoyarsk. From him I learned that many of the people who were deported in 1941 had been unable to endure the hardship and had been dying in masses. Especially hard had been the fate of Latvian army officers who had been deported in 1941 from the military camp at Litten. Only very few of them uh, survived. A friend of mine was deported to a place near Omsk while his daughter was taken to Kazakhstan. As far as I know of, she is still there and has been told they would never let her go back to Latvia because she was accused of having aided guerrillas. As I heard these and other reports about people who had been deported to other areas of Siberia, I understood that even in deportation, God had stood by me. And now, after uh, after reading all of this, I would like to give some responses, you know, of um, the communists themselves to these dreadful things. Because, you know, it is kind of scary that, you know, that what, what happened here essentially was a massive war crime. The Nuremberg trials are, are past and, and Nazi crime, war crimes have been have been judged and the people have been sentenced and, and uh, rightfully so and people are being trialed for their crimes even today but, but strangely enough no such thing has happened for communists in mass scale during the Nuremberg war trials the United States chief prosecutor Robert H. Jackson spoke the following <clears throat> he stressed that um Human intelligence requires that laws be not limited to the punishing of small crimes committed by small people. The law must also reach those men who have appropriated great power and have used such power with the advised intent to evoke such evil that no one home in the world is left untouched by it. And further on, let me state clearly. It is true that for the time being this law is applied against German aggressors only, but the conclusion must follow, if this trial is to do any good, that every aggression against other nations must be condemned and that none shall be exempt from this law, including those who are sitting here as judges. These camps of Vorkuta, Karangara and Kolyma, all these nice gulag camps, which are like... basically the same as Nazi camps, right? And there is... There is no justice done. There is there there hasn't been any trials about this, and and there will be no justice anymore because ninety nine percent of of everyone involved is, are just dead by now. But this is this is how the world works, I suppose, and um, and I'm the, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this show because if I can't judge them, I can prosecute them and inform what was going on at least. Yeah, but this is not one of the one of the interesting part is that um you know we we so far have uh, have been talking only about the crimes committed by by Stalin basically because all of these deportations happened between the power of Stalin but you know you you would be mistaken because all this process of deportations and sending people to these camps and to Siberia you know Khrushchev took a major part in it after all he was in one of these troikas and he was a major Major KGB officer. I mean, according to to some sources here, Ukrainian sources specifically, he because he was ruling Ukraine under Stalin, 
and he sent to Siberia about 3.5 million peasants, you know. It, he was one of the major perpetrators of, of all of these all of these deeds and uh, at the same time at the same time there was his speech published in New York Times in September 24th 1960 and he there spoke that uh, quote Ours is the age of struggle for freedom when the peoples are shaking foreign yokes on their shoulders. The peoples want a worthy life and are fighting for it. The victory has been won already in many countries and in many lands. Can we relax, however? We know indeed that tens of millions of people are still languishing in colonial bondage and are experiencing cruel deprivations. Yeah, Mr. Khrushchev. They are, indeed. And uh, in the same month, September 1960... In an issue of party's central committee publication, Communist, uh, Alexander Vovin defines the Soviet morality in the kind of these kind of ambiguous words there. They're not very clear, but um, you can make out some things from them. Yes, we communists reject bourgeoisie's morality, which is full of hypocrisy, individualism, cruelty. Communist ethics, like the communist culture, is general. Is in general is the natural outgrowth of the massed human values of highly developed philosophies. The best qualities of human morality are fully expressed only in communism. Later, later that year, in November 1960, an Indian journalist, uh, D. G. Savarkar, basically writes. But Mr. Khrushchev appears to have given no thought of the possibility that there are peoples and nations who would like to be rid of the Soviet Union's domination over them as much as the Africans have wanted to free themselves from Western colonial rule. Imperialism to Mr. Khrushchev is strictly the other man's crime. He regards himself and his country as incapable of committing it. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because... Um, Moscow, basically, when when it's talking of liberation of peoples, like we can see, as obviously they have, uh, li- in modern day, they continue this trend by liberating Crimea, and the Tarabistan, by the way, northern Mo- Moldavia, which no one recognizes as a country, in South Ossetia, and all other places, they're all liberators. You know, liberation basically means nothing much that, you know, their, their own specific branch of um, imperialism. Because obviously imperialism exists only where the others do the subjugation. It's kind of weird. Best kind of morality indeed. You know, before I'm, I'm, I finish this part off, because it's been uh, quite a long one indeed, I, I have another, another piece of communist, communist paper to just deliver to you, because... This is a Halloween episode, Reformation Day episode, um, and it's full with nasties. But you know, sometimes I, sometimes I have to do these um, very heavy episodes. The following statement, sign statement, appeared in Paduim Latvijas Communists, or Communist Sovietske Latvi, the Communist of Latvia. It was the Latvian language communist newspaper, and this was written in Riga, September 1959. It was an identical statement appeared in the Russian language as well, but um, it's a statement by Arvid Spelsche, the general secretary of the Central Committee of Latvian Communist Party, the head guy of, of Latvia at that time, a Latvian, fellow Latvian himself, ten years after the mass deportations and everything. This is something how he judged what was going on, because obviously the, the, we, we cannot commit any crimes whatsoever, and uh, even though denunciations of mass shootings were common... This thing, this this thing, um, in during Khrushchev's era was knew uh, it a bit differently. And um, here's a report: <clears throat> Anyone who is not blinded by nationalism can understand that, for instance, increasing the product- productive forces in Kazakhstan to their present level would not would would not have been impossible if a good number of able workers from other republics had not been channeled to that country. Just as it would have been impossible to raise the level of Latvian industry to where it now is without a mechanical intensive of population derived from other brotherly republics. Except, you know, that we actually lost production in there, but, you know. And this is, this is how it goes, ladies and gentlemen. This is how it goes, comrades. And I, I hope you understand them using this, this uh, terribly sarcastically by now. But this is how it goes. 
and there are war crimes and there are terrible fates and um and <laughs> we're not even done yet the, this is not even the final part of of all this story the study will continue and i hope it'll end in part four in the meantime i will also be finally publishing my part one for my patreon subscribers of um of that book, but yeah, let's be done with now. And uh, by now, you shouldn't be afraid of ghosts anymore, or aliens for that matter, or anything, or anything else. Ghosts scare you. Not of aliens them. kidnap you. None of them have killed people, killed your people in mass, and sent them to die and enslave them. I hope this never happens again. Have a spooky evening. Good night. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.